Okay, hold on just a minute. We're, we're almost finished, but not quite finished. Oh my gosh, I forgot about this part. I literally <laughs> forgot. Uh, well, you know, you've asked me a lot of questions yeah. and um, we rarely have the opportunity to be together. I'd like to ask you some questions. So uh, are you okay? Can I, can I yeah. interview you, sure. Regina? Sure, yeah, anything goes. Okay. I wanna have really open and honest rapport with you, so anything goes. All right, so we're gonna do interview, take okay. two. Okay. <laughs> I want to welcome everyone to the Greg and Regina show. <laughs> We've just finished an interview together, one that was long, long overdue. And I want to take this opportunity to turn the tables a little bit and uh, me be the interviewer and ask our Regina some questions uh, I've always wanted to know, and I bet you want to know them as well. So yeah, I just Regina, had this welcome. sprung on me today, right? <laughs> <laughs> welcome, okay. welcome to the Greg and Regina show. Why, or thank Regina you. Greg show. Why, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Greg. Yeah. <laughs> so how's it feel to, if I ask you uh, a couple of questions? I want to get to know you a little bit better. I'm, Are you okay I'm with pretty that? much an open book. Just shoot whatever you're interested well, I've got, in. I've got four really, uh, really important questions here mm -hmm. that were distilled from a lot of others. And mm -hmm. I, I think the first one, I'm curious, was there in your life, was there a, was there? a profound experience, and if there was, what was that experience that really kind of led you into this profession and the moment where you said, this is what I want to do? It's well, there was a precipitating event that opened me up to all of the research and exploration I did that then led me to this as a profession. And uh -huh. that, that little journey started with um, my very first meditation. I was with a girlfriend in Atlanta, Georgia, and she had been doing TM. I didn't know anything about anything. Mm. I'd been raised in uh, Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, which was very strict. And I knew everything I wasn't supposed to do, and I knew the exclusionary aspects of it. Very exclusive, everyone else goes, you know, to hell. And I didn't buy it. <laughs> I thought, that's, that's not it. Okay. So I was kind of agnostic and young. And so this is the first time I'd heard of meditation. She also believed in reincarnation, which I found terribly frightening. That wasn't mm. part of the Lutheran faith. And so we did a meditation. She said, make up a sound, because you don't have a guru. Make up a sound and do a meditation. Oh, that's right. In, in you TM, you, you have a sound. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, I just made up my own, really simple one. And she put me in a room with a timer. 20 minute timer and said, now say this word over and over. So after about, I don't know, maybe five to 10 minutes into the meditation, um, I had a vision mm. and it was profound. I mean, it took over everything and was in slow motion. And what I saw was an Indian woman in a red sari in a very arid region, hurl herself to her death off of a cliff in mm. slow motion. I thought, whoa, who is that? Well, I came out and she said, you saw what? And I said, yeah. She said, that's your first meditation. I said, I, I don't know what this is about. What was I seeing? And she said, well, I have no idea. So then I started, I just, I remembered it. I thought about it. And as time went on, I kept being invited into these various circles because I was somewhat high profile in media already hmm. by this time, because I was very young when I started. And so the local psychic that did astrological and psychic readings on television and radio in our city said, oh, come on, I want to invite you in to do this and do a reading on you. Everyone kept inviting me in. And so each time I would have these profound experiences where they'd say, let's try a little of this. Didn't matter what it was. And I found I could, I could do most of these things. And I thought, what is at work here? And that's what led to the next step. Well, I know that I have a lingering question, and I bet our viewers do as well. Who was the native woman that went off that cliff? Do you have a sense of who that was? Me. That's. I didn't want. I didn't want to imply that, but Me. I wanted to ask. If I that... didn't know that for many, many years. It was, and, and actually, I was talking to um, an East Indian American friend of mine, mm. and I told her about this vision, and she said, "Oh, yes. Well, what happened in ancient times is when an invading." king and his forces would come in and take over the kingdom and the wives of the existing king, many of the wives would commit suicide and they'd put on their red dress, wow. their red sari from wow. their wedding and hurl themselves or poison themselves. And that hurling yourself to your death was one of the means of suicide. I thought, because hmm. uh, I felt like I feel real resonance with her in the culture. So I ultimately st be, uh, came to believe that was me. And when you had that first meditation, how old were you? 23. Okay, so it was young. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. So, so well, that's going to lead into um, another question that, that now 
comes from mm -hmm. you exploring these uh, these traditions and the things that weren't part of your, your upbringing originally. So was there a theory or was there a particular yeah. research that you have learned about, uh, or for somebody that it was a guest of yours maybe at, at one point, that really just really triggered, really intrigued you the most? Was there one that yeah. stand of all the, the thousands that you've done, is there one that really Well, it, it was foundational to that point in my yeah. development. So I'd had these experiences. I'd been uh, kind of spontaneously dropping into past lives. Um, but, but again, I knew people who facilitated, come to our past life class. Oh, sure, I'll be there. And I'd start <laughs> seeing things. So it was always just for me, fun, just experimenting, but things happen. And so I started wondering what binds all this together. And I stumbled across um, Michael Talbot's book, mm. okay? And that, Beyond the Quantum. And that's the first time I actually tried to intersect my experience with science. And that was profound for me because I found that I could see in terms of energy. So where I couldn't do algebra, physics, quantum physics was easier for me to be able to grok. I, I know that book very well. You know, Fritoff Capra, The mm -hmm. Tao of Physics, mm -hmm. was the first one that opened that door. And then Michael Talbot's book followed on. For with, you. For, for the, from the quantum perspective. And those yes. two were like bookends for, for me. So, so we've had parallel Oh, that's interesting. In, in that, did in you know respect. Michael? I never got to interview him. I did not uh, know him personally. I yeah. felt like I knew him because his work was so present. So profound. And, but he did die young. He did, sadly. So I didn't get to meet him, and I wish I had. Yeah. But that what I found was foundational to see how energy works with mind. Yeah. It's like, what are all these things? What do they have in common? It's my perception, but they feel very real. So then that has to get you into going beyond the scope of science into belief, which has to do, say, for example, with reincarnation. Sure. And once I started seeing how these, how these, this wheel of events can work cyclically for our own personal development, um, that's the point at which I, I had someone come into my life who was a channeler, though I didn't know what channeling was at the time. Hmm. And that guide that came in to speak to me, everything changed in, in the room. The energy changed. It changed in my body. And then when they started telling me things I'd just been thinking about, yeah. I thought, okay, okay, I'll pay attention. And I started getting uh, an education over the course of about 20 or 30 years of very profound information that dovetails and intersects and actually validates and supports what you do, sure. well, much of what we talk about. Well, there's a beautiful place where science and spirituality uh, come together. And many scientists have said to me that what we call the spiritual and the mystic is simply the science that has yet to be revealed. Exactly. Uh, because the as the science begins to tell us about other worlds and our relationship to those worlds, that is the vocabulary that helps us to understand the experiences exactly. that we're having. So as you began to have those kinds of experiences, uh, I just want to ask, I probably know the answer to this because it probably has something to do with where we met, but is there ever, is there a, a physical location on earth that has had uh, a, a profound influence, like a vortex or a mystical okay. place? That... So I know why you think you know the answer and it would be my second choice. <laughs> okay. Actually, that okay. would be my second choice, right. which of course is Sedona. Sedona yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's well, when we, I first we interviewed, interviewed there, yeah. Exactly, many, many years ago. And, um, that, w that would be the second place. That's everywhere. I lived in the middle of those vortexes for many, many years. And so they just became a normal background of life. But one that was punctuated by something so outrageous that I would have to say it takes the place of that. I was in Israel uh -huh. and I was with uh, Vernon Wolf, and we were on, a, I guess you could say his hollow dynamic peace mission between the Palestinians and Israelis. So I was in both territories. And on this one particular day, I believe it was the either Christmas Eve or the day before, we had some time off and we chose to go to the John the Baptist Monastery in Ankaram. I know exactly where this is. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. John the Baptist baptismal. Well, that it's said that this monastery was built around what has always been believed to be that baptismal well. Yeah. And those wild, rugged mountains that he did his vision work in, in caves. So this was almost a miracle. Ariel Sharon, was in the hospital right near there. Media from around the world was there. He had just fallen into his coma, oh. really, after his scandal. Yeah. Everyone was there. No one was at the monastery. And here it is. I mean, this is a holy 
place for people in all faiths to come to, especially around the season of Christmas and Hajj and, and Hanukkah. No. no one was there. The whole monastery, our parking lot was basically, well, it was empty. So I was with two other people and I said, I want to check out that little cave above the baptismal well. They initially came in with me and thought, well, cool, and left. And I thought, mm-mm. So I sat down in one of those teensy little um, chairs they have. And as soon as I sat down, everything unfolded. Wow. It was a cosmic event. And being started showing up, um, my hands just spontaneously floated up. And then I was being downloaded with Egyptian hieroglyphics and hand, the, the hand positions that they use in the various glyphs. And it was going so fast, uh, I could understand pieces of it in the moment. But as, sec the soon that, as soon as that nanosecond left, it was a blank and I didn't know anything, but I knew it had been downloaded into my field for something at a later time. It was profound and it was later validated because my meditation partner in real life, I talked to her right after that. She said, oh, I'm sorry I didn't answer the phone earlier. I was in a dream with you somewhere. I said, oh, let me tell you where we were. We were in a cave <laughs> above the John the Baptist baptismal well. So uh, there was knowledge that was put in that I still don't know the mm. meaning of and I don't know the purpose for yet, but I don't think I've ever had anything so profound, so spontaneous and so visceral as that. Wow. Have yeah. you been back since that time? No. Mm -mm. I, I know those caves. I've been in those caves. I'm sure you have been. I've been there. For me, the, the, my deepest experience in the Holy Lands was at a place where a lot of people didn't even go and it was Mary Magdalene's birthplace. Oh, I wish I'd been and, there. Uh, what was that like? Well, I'm a double Cancerian male, uh, so for me, I interpret the world largely through emotion, and um, and so it was it was about a lot of tears for me, uh, just acknowledging the existence of such a powerful feminine energy. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's interesting how we can have such very, very different experiences, you know, being in in, in that land. Yeah. So well, each one of those places, I think, contains that frequency for you to tap into. Yeah, well, so it's, different it's different for everyone. Specific. It's different yeah. for, and if you had been in Sedona, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it would probably be uh, with the red sandstone, mm -hmm. uh, red uh, and, and the quartz sandstone, it would have been a very different experience, mm -hmm. I think, a, a completely different kind of awareness and mm -hmm. knowing this being downloaded. So, mm -hmm. so can I ask you one more? You sure, one, one more. more yeah, question. sure, why not? So was there a, a particular experience uh, or a subject that's been like absolutely the most impactful in, uh, in, in this journey now that you've embarked on for so many years, your, your consciousness journey. Is there one particular experience has been, or maybe that was just it that you just shared with me, I don't know. No, that, that kind of happened. Okay. That wasn't at my request, you know. All right. It just happened. I would say something I have engaged with has been remote viewing. Mm. I mean, even in, even in terms of doing remote viewing and uh, workshops by people who've been in the military and so forth. And it has always, to me, been a very uh, kind of the fulcrum point where you're observing and witnessing and documenting phenomena. It's one area they ha that they have done a lot of observation of phenomena. And that phenomena, to me, is the most fascinating because you're taking worlds of information and folding it in to your own ability to perceive. And it can go far beyond anything we know, far beyond an earth experience down to when I was remote viewing in one, one workshop and we had, you only get what, a minute and a half to two minutes, you have to view oh. quickly. You're seeing something very specific. In this case, it was an Indian arrowhead to being able to travel out into the cosmos and connect with other cultures. Mm. And so the, the, where the mind meets the all to me is fascinating and the experience of remote viewing simply is a way to manifest that. Yeah, it definitely brings together so many of the scientific as well as the spiritual principles. I love it. Yeah, uh, that's why. In, yeah. Into, it's where the rubber meets the road. Exactly. Uh, and, and I think it's something that we all have a, a, a tendency to do maybe spontaneously, mm -hmm. but to do it consciously and at will and on demand. I think that that really opens the door to just how powerful we are. Absolutely, so. but another thing I have to say, Greg, was our interconnection with the fields around us and your work came in for me very early on. Mm. I think, I'm guessing it was around 90, 91, I first came in contact with your book, Zero Point. 
Um, it was written in 1986. I, I, yeah, I wrote so, the book in 86, self-published in 86. Yes, I remember. And it was, it, I remember the book. Yeah, you remember it, it looked like a self-published book. It looked book, like right? a self-published <laughs> book, a manual. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I remember reading that and I, I still remember like, oh my God, hmm. our brains and our bodies are tuned to the magnetic fields of this planet, which is tuned to the cosmos as well. And I always, I have to say, I've always wondered, because you've gone on to so many other things, Reading that hmm. book, we were talking. You were talking about the dissipation of the magnetic field, and I'm thinking as I learn about how the brain is supported by the magnetic field. Uh -huh. Where are we now? That was 30 years ago. Sure. Where are we now, Greg? Well, first of all, thank you for for even reading. You, you may have been one of the five people that read my my first book. Well, I, don't I was know. late to the game. Five <laughs> years after you published, the uh, you know that book was written when I was working in the corporations as a scientist uh, for engineers and scientists who felt left out of the spiritual conversation. They just didn't relate to the language. And I said, I know you guys are interested in the topic, but maybe it's the words that need to be tweaked. So I took the spiritual principles and shared them in scientific terms of electromagnetic fields and uh, ion potentials and neural perceptions and things like that. Uh, and that book became the zero point book. The magnetic fields of the earth, as a geologist, uh, I, I'm a degree earth scientist, a geologist, and I saw uh, in the early 1990s that the, the fields are collapsing very quickly in, in earth terms, in geologic terms, you know, not today or tomorrow, but they have been declining for the last 2,000 years, and the, the magnetic fields of the earth right now are at the lowest point that they've been in, in the last 2,000 years. But still descending. They are descending, and, and this is a field that connects all life. Right. Every blade of grass, every hamster, every goldfish, every CEO of every corporation, every leader of every nation uh, is linked through this field. And because of that, scientists study it uh, extensively. And what we're now beginning to understand is that I did not know in 1986 is that there is a two-way dialogue, two-way conversation. It is a dialogue between us and this field of the earth. Not only does it influence us, but we have the ability, Regina, to influence uh, this field that connects all things. The influence comes from the human heart. And what the studies show very clearly, new studies within just the last few years, is that mass human emotion uh, of things like gratitude, appreciation, compassion, care, positive emotions, heart-based from a state that we call coherence within the body, actually creates coherence in that magnetic field. And this is mm. important mm -hmm. because when the magnetic fields are strong and coherent, we as communities, as families, uh, as nations, as a planet, we're more cooperative and we're more willing to work together to solve our problems. And the, the reverse is true as well. When we are angry, uh, even well-intentioned anger, the field only knows chaos or coherence. So when we are angry, angrily protesting, for example, we're actually creating chaos and uh, in that magnetic field uh, and contributing to the very thing that we're hoping to change. So I didn't know that in, in 1986. Not only is the field declining, mm -hmm. but we are now feeding that field and we have the ability to do it consciously to tip the scales in our favor for peace and cooperation. And if I wrote Awakening yes. 0 0.2, that's what it would be. And it's so interesting that you say that because at the time when I heard it, I thought, oh goodness, we're going to have poles reversing. I, I was afraid initially mm. thinking these massive earth changes are going to come because I was a newbie. I was young. I was just looking at all this for the first time. But I remember on the heels of that, uh, some years later, what I talked to before about the guide mm -hmm. that I had, that initial, that's, I'm part of that soul tribe. So they've speak, they still speak to me. And I asked specifically, what's happening with these earth changes? And I gave specifics, this is going to happen in Florida, New York, California. And they said, well, when that time arrives, much will have to do with the consciousness of the people upon the place. Mm -hmm. I did not understand what they meant at the time. I thought, well, how does our consciousness affect what's going to happen to the land chain, earth changes. Yeah. And they were very clear about that. And I had to go away for a few years and think about it some more. It's exactly what you just stated. It's a very different way of thinking because we're conditioned that we are separate from the world around us mm -hmm. and have little of any influence over the events in our own body, let alone the world outside of our body. Yes. The science is showing 
just the opposite, that we live uh, in a living universe. The universe is alive, conscious, and intelligent, as mm -hmm. we said in our interview, uh, and that we are part of rather than separate from. And, and the, the piece, and, and we can wrap with this, but the, the piece that really helped me to, to embrace this was when I went to the CERN superconducting yes. super collider in, in uh, Geneva, and I was talking to, to one of the physicists there, and we were talking about the field. And he said, well, you know, the field, it's, it's not just out there. He said, every atom yes. of your body is emerging and collapsing into the field. He says, you are the field. Yeah. We are the field. And when we really begin to get that, then we know that what we become is what we're feeding that field. And that changes everything. Everything. I, it's I been have, so fun talking well, I, I with you. I have another question. I have okay, to talk to you sure. about boots. So we, we both, both have, have shiny our, black we've boots got our, on. Our boots on. Are you a boot wearer? I have two types of of, of footwear, <laughs> sandals and boots. I don't really wear anything in between. Me, I, and that's they, why I wait for March so I can get out of my boots and into my sandals. So I only wear civilized shoes about three months a year. See, I feel like I know you better now. I, they say I was born in boots, which would have been tough on, on my mom. You're a year-round boot guy, right? <laughs> I, I am. Yeah. And I never throw them away. I probably, uh, I've got a collection of boots that goes back over 40 years. So and because I, I know I where like you're your from, boots, I know where you get some of your boots in Santa Fe at that famous boot shop. That's true. Well, we got a full Beautiful. shot. You can see our shiny boots today. Thank you all for joining. <laughs> I hope you feel as I do, like we know Regina a little bit better now. Thank you. Yeah.